about some of the unique occurrences and erosion that's happening on portions of Pine Point Beach. And so I think at the suggestion or request of a couple of counselors, they just wanted to know more about what's going on there and, and uh, maybe we can talk about uh, what steps uh, the town should or shouldn't take or how we could be involved um, going forward. So we're blessed uh, this evening to have one of our town residents uh, who happens to be the, really the state, uh, I'll say the state um, expert in these regards. Uh, Peter Slavinsky is uh, actually chairman of our conservation commission. Mm -hmm. Uh, more importantly for tonight, he's a geologist with the Maine Geological Survey and actually has done some very specific work on Pine Point Beach and uh, would love to share with you some of the technical issues kind of related to the dynamics of wind and wave and sand and erosion and accretion, all those wonderful words. So Pete is here and has a bit of a presentation for you, so do you have any comments before you start? Uh, no, it's just a, a pleasure to be here in front of the council and to, to provide some more information uh, give a kind of a geological background as to historical context as to one of the, some of the modern day processes that we're seeing there uh, and hopefully provide some more information for you. Thank you. So due to our technical limitations, <laughs> Pete's going to have to stand at the podium uh, as he goes through. So <laughs> I'll shift around so you're not looking at my back. So I, guess I think that screen and the other and the small screen are the two best. This one up too if you want. Yeah, that would be better. <laughs> Um, so basically, uh, again, my name is Peter Slavinsky, marine geologist with the Maine Geological Survey, and uh, what I'd like to do is kind of give you historical context as to, as to shoreline change within Saco Bay and what drives it, because we can't understand minute little changes what's going on at a little sliver of Pine Point without looking at the bigger context of the changes that we're seeing. Then we'll touch on some of the current trends that are going on at Pine Point and talk about some of the likely causes uh, of, of the changes that we're seeing. So this graph, that, this picture that I'm showing you basically is creating what we call a sediment budget. It's simply like, like a bank account. What, you, what you, you have in one part of the bank account, you can shift to the other from like checking to savings or savings to checking. Historically speaking, all of the sand that we see in Saco Bay is derived from the Saco River. Uh, basically, the White Mountains of Road sediment moves down the Saco River, moves out into Saco Bay at Camp Ellis, and then moves northward. And historically, that's what's happened for thousands of years. Now, in the 1800s, the Army Corps of Engineers built jetties, as we all know, at Camp Ellis, um, and that diverted sand about a mile offshore. So the sand that did come down the river was being diverted farther offshore, but eventually it would work its way into Old Orchard Beach and eventually to Pine Point. Pine Point is what we call a sediment sink. The whole Scarborough area is what we call a sediment sink. That is, that's where all the sand in the bay basically ends up. That's why we have shoaling problems in the Scarborough River, and it needs to be dredged about every five years, even though it only gets dredged about every ten. Um, so the concept here is that the s amount of sand that's coming out of the Saco River has been decreased. The erosion at Camp Ellis now is supplying a lot of the sand to Saco Bay, but the point is, is that it's all ending up in Pine Point. Did you say, did you say the Saco River sediment is decreasing? Yes, in okay. general, and the reason for that is because of damming, the number of dams that have been put in over the years. Um, so I'm going to show you a couple charts that come from several different studies to give you the concept of this, this positive sediment budget that's occurring at the northern end of the bay where St. Moore Pine Point is. So this um, is a study from the United States Geological Survey uh, where they looked at shoreline change rates from about 1850 through 2000. And the little red box there is showing uh, Pine Point and the Scarborough River at the northern end of the red box, or the left side. The right side is down near Camp Ellis. And then I've extrapolated that and kind of blown up the graph that you see there. And really, the, one of the strongest positive shoreline chain signals over this entire period is at Pine Point. So we're seeing shoreline changes of about one and a half to two meters over that time per year, okay, since 1850 to 2000. So significant growing of the shoreline at Pine Point and some minor erosion of the shoreline down near Camp Ellis. Another study that was done by the Woods Hole Group as part of a Section 111 project down at the Camp Ellis um, area looked at shoreline changes from 1864 to 1998. Now, the chart on the left is showing basically shoreline changes along the entire Saco Bay, the uh, bottom part of the chart where it says Saco River entrance, just think of that as the shoreline as you're going northward in the bay. What we're looking at are the, on the right-hand side of the 
chart is a positive shoreline change in feet per year, and on the left-hand side of the chart is negative shoreline change. So really, the only negative changes that we're seeing in the long term in the bay is down near the Saco River entrance. And as you migrate northwards towards Pine Point and the Scarborough River, you see a very, very strong positive signal in the long term. Okay. On the right-hand chart, what that is doing is it's breaking down the shoreline changes into different time periods, 1864 to 1944, 1864 to 1998, that's that long term from the blue, and then 1944 to 1998. Now what I'd like to do is focus in on the upper part of that chart where, 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 where the Scarborough River and Pine Point are. And all of those signals are positive for the long term. Can so I we just ask a question? I mean, sure. I've heard reported from folks, um, you know, as recent as 30 years ago, all those little roads that go off East Grand, and I'm not sure if it's so true off Pillsbury Shores, but I'm told that the beach used to start right where those little roads end. Now that there, now there's two or three hundred feet of frontal dune with you know Correct. fully dune grass. Correct. That's the phenomenon you're talking about. That's what we're seeing. Yes, we're, we're seeing dramatic shift, a dramatic shift of sediment from the southern end of the bay to the northern end of the bay, and that's what's been going on over a long period of time, much longer than 1864 to 1998. That's just when we have uh, data to make measurements from. So this is basically showing if you average those three lines out, somewhere around three, three and a half feet per year of accretion uh, up near the Scarborough River. This is, what that this is the data that that study was derived from. Um, so you're looking at about three and a half, maybe four feet over that stretch of the shoreline that I've shown with the black box. Um, again, nearest the jetty is about five feet per year. As you go farther and farther away from the jetty, you're down to about two and a half feet per year. Again, this is all a positive trend um, over this long-term period. But that, that's the 1998, though, right? That's 1864 to 1998, yes. What's happened? Did you We're going to get there. Oh, it shows yeah. what the reason I'm showing the long-term trend is important to put it in the context <laughs> of the short-term episodic changes we're seeing. Thank you. Another long-term shoreline study that our office did, uh, did the same thing. It, it broke the Saco Bay up into four different regions, and the Scarborough River's in, in between region three and four. Uh, <coughs> Western Beach is region four. And this looked at shoreline change from 1962 to 1995. And the net shoreline change over that period was about 150 feet. So if you average that out for per year, it's about four and a half feet per year. So what, what that's just showing is it's saying, Okay, over the long term, 1860s to 1998, we've seen one trend. This is a slightly shorter 33-year period. We're also seeing a positive trend. We also looked at something that a lot of people care about um, when you're on the beach and looking at the beach, and that is what we, something we call dry beach width. That's basically the width from the high water line to the edge of the dune or the vegetation. It's our recreational beach, basically. And you can see that's the blue line that I'm showing here. Now, the Scarborough River area is right around uh, uh, 40,000 feet, if you look at that uh, X scale on the bottom. And you'll see that adjacent, right adjacent to the jetty, you see a dry beach width of about 100 feet. But as you move away from the jetty, that dry beach width gets very, very narrow to about 10, 15 feet. Okay? This is a phenomenon we've been seeing in 1995 in this. So just make note of that, because we'll touch back on that in the future. Um, this is uh, another chart from the same study just showing a variation of basically what the beach looks like in a three-dimensional sense, compressed and made into pretty colors. So from Goose Fair Brook up to the Scarborough River, you can see down at Goose Fair, the beach is very, very sloped. You have really, really uh, heavily sloped. You have very, very high dunes. Then there's an area of Old Orchard Beach, compartment 3B, which is low dunes and kind of a less of a slope. When you, when you walk the beach, this is what you see. As you get down to the Scarborough River, there's a very, very flat profile that extends much farther out. That's because the sand is moving up the bay and getting trapped up near the jetty. Okay? So, what is actually driving the episodic erosion that we're seeing at Pine Point? So the long-term trend is it's positive. Okay? But over that long-term trend, if you look at a year-to-year -year basis or even five- to ten-year decadal basis, there are some significant factors that are in play in terms of causing what we call episodic erosional events at Pine Point, and that's what we're going to touch on now. And the three concepts that I'd like to share with you are what we call shoal movement and bypassing. It's a natural process. We'll touch on that in the next couple slides. Uh, a shore parallel secondary tidal channel, which causes tidal current interaction with Pine Point that causes erosion and accretion. And then a deeper nearshore channel that causes wave attack and scour during storm events. And I'll show you how all three of those interact by showing you a bunch of images. 
So the first, this is the first one. This is from a 1987 oblique imagery uh, that my uh, coworker Steve Dixon took. But the concept again is, is as you're moving sand up the bay, it's getting trapped in an ebb tidal shoal, which is labeled on there, ebb shoal. Some of the sand is getting sucked into the Scarborough River and deposited in the anchorage in areas that were just dredged because it's a sediment sink. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, a process that's very important in terms of what we're talking about is what we call shoal bypassing. So sand moves up the bay and gets caught in that ebb shoal that's shown on the image. But over time, sand works its way across the channel to Western Beach. And historically, that's what had been happening for hundreds of years. But in 1962, <laughs> the Army Corps of Engineers put another jetty in uh, on, the, on the northern end of, of uh, the, actually, it's the southern end of the Scarborough River, and um, to try to stop the flow of sand into the Scarborough River. Now, what that has done, and then they started dredging it. So what that has done is when the dredging was, uh, was, was ongoing every five, ten years, that sand was being dredged and removed and put offshore. They, they would take it and dump it off far offshore to get it out of the system. But in doing so, what they were doing was removing all the sand that would get to Western Beach. And that's why Western Beach has been eroding very, very badly. That's kind of a side discussion that we can talk about more. But these processes, I'd like you to note the ebb shoal the deeper trough that's labeled, and then the small channel. Okay? Those are three different things we want to look at in the next couple slides. This just gives you another idea of what this looks like. Again, this is a 1987 image. Again, there's that deeper trough, which, which goes right up to the beach, and that's that really, the little arrows that I'm showing there is a really narrow, dry beach width. Okay? That's because there's this deeper trough that exists up to there. Now, as you follow, you have a shoal of sand, and then you come along this little small channel that's formed at the edge of the jetty there. There's a very, very large dry beach with there, probably about 75 feet, uh, maybe 100 feet. But what's key here also is that there's a very good distance from the high water line, if it's a, even if it's up at the edge of the dune, from the high water line to where the first habitable structures are. There's a lot of dunes that have accreted in there over the last 50 years. Okay? That, oh, that entire dune system that you see there, built in the last 50 years. All of Pine Point is basically on dredged material also that was replaced by dredging of the Scarborough River, okay? That occurred in the late 50s. So that kind of, this, this next slide summarizes that whole cycle. So in 1956, about 128,000 cubic yards of material was dredged from the river, and it was placed on Pine Point in 1956, 1957 to create Pillsbury Drive and everything that we see there that houses are built on now. In 1962, the jetty was built, and then there was a whole bunch of uh, dredging that occurred where sediment was taken offshore. And then in 2005 and 2014, sediment, when it was dredged, was placed on Western Beach to mimic that shoal bypassing I was telling you about. Okay. But we're looking at an average of about 14,000 cubic yards per year, about 93,000 cubic yards per dredge. This is just to give you the, an idea of how man is influencing this system. So let's now go back in time over the last 50 years, roughly, and take a look at a series of aerial photographs to look at these shorter-term episodic erosional events that are driven by those three processes I talked about. This is a 1962 image. Um, it's basically right after the jetty was constructed. There's a lot of messy, sandy material in that ebb shoal being shown here. But that little small channel is still there. I think that little small channel plays a significant role in very, very localized erosion that we see at Pine Point. Basically, in the image that you see here, you can see how it can swing inland right up against the beach, and then it can also swing seaward. And I think it's the combination of that and the deeper trough that we have here that, that produces wave attack on a section of Pine Point Beach. So we'll get into those in a second. Can, can I ask a question? Sure. Wasn't pre, before the jetty, wasn't the flow of the river to the edge of Pine Point and then south along Pine Point before it went out. There was actually, well, it depends on how far back you go, but Pine Point used to be, I'm sorry, I'm like, I tend to wander when I speak. Pine Point actually used to be a barrier island, um, and there was a the little river uh, down near, as you went towards Old Orchard Beach, um, and Pine Point itself was a barrier island. 
in the 18, mid 1850s or 1860s, I think it was, a railroad, the railroad was built, mm -hmm. and that closed off Little River. So, and then Pine Point became what we call spit. So it's a long spit. So tidal flow used to come in and out of the Scarborough River, and yes, it used to vary quite a bit in that area right there, but it also used to come in and out of the Little River and then com combine behind Pine Point in the Jones Creek area. Um, just for uh, reference, I've included in the red box there, the Bureau of Parks and Lands has a conservation easement that exists in this area, and uh, it's the subject of some debate uh, as to what can and can't occur in that conservation easement, and I'm not going to be talking about what can and cannot occur in the conservation easement. That's more of a legal question that's being worked on with the AG's office. Um, but I'm putting it here to give, it, to give you a spatial context for the changes that we're going to be observing in these different aerial photographs that I'll be showing you. So this is 1962, and if you look at Prime Point itself, there's not even really even a house there yet. They're starting to creep into the area. This is 1977. And these images are kind of have just been rubber sheeted and stuff, so they're not perfect, but they'll give you an idea of the changes that we're seeing. So 1962, you can't really make out a shoreline. 1977, um, you can't, it's a high tide image, you can't see the shoals or the deep trough, but again, you can see how the shoreline's kind of starting to get sandy shoals, moving along it, uh, building up, but you do see a slight erosive signal uh, nearest the jetty. This is jumping to 1995. The yellow arrows that I'm showing here show areas of slight erosion. The green arrows will be showing you areas of slight progradation or accretion, okay? So, jumping from 1977 or even in 1962, pay attention to the main channel, the deeper trough, and the small channel first. So the main channel now has been maintained by the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, there's an area that they dredge it to. You can see that the Ebb Shoal has extended well farther offshore, much farther offshore than the 1962 image. Mm -hmm. And you can also see that there's a nice defined deep trough um, just south, I guess, or to the left of the Ebb Shoal. And you can see all these different little sandbars moving around. And there's all these dynamic processes that are occurring in this thing called an Ebb Tidal Shoal. And this deep trough actually creates a connection almost to the beach. And there are times when the area of the beach adjacent to the deep trough grow, and there's times when it's area, the areas adjacent to the small channel grow, and there's times when they both erode. So now we're jumping to 1998. Again, ebb shoal, deep trough, small channel. The, end, the pine point end closest to the jetty has grown in terms of the vegetation at the beach there. So we're going from this to this. And there's an area of erosion adjacent to that deeper trough. The green arrow there to there, okay? But there's a, a dry beach with increase along almost the entire beach there. Now these are taken at different tides, so don't pay attention to the uh, the tidal areas. It's a little harder to see. Try to pay attention to that dry beach width when we're talking about that. But again, that trough and that channel persist. And if you look, um, the channel, the small channel in the 1995 image looks like it's almost whipped up to the dune. There's an erosive trend at that time. And this time, it, it, it looks like it's perched itself a little bit towards the end of the, uh, the jetty, um, and there's a period of growth of the dune in that area. Okay. So now we're going to jump to 2001. So again, we're going from this to this. And if you look closely where the middle green arrow and then the middle green arrow here, you can see that there's been growth of the dune. Okay. Adjacent to the two green arrows, the one on the right and the one on the left. And there's an area of erosion, significant erosion actually, uh, of the dune where the yellow arrow is. Okay. But again, that small channel persists and that deep trough persists. And I think that the deep trough wave attack occurs on that section of beach where the yellow arrow is. So now we're going to jump to 2003. So this is going from this image to this image. So again, the trough and channel are there. Um, there's dune loss near the jetty. And it's kind of hard to see, but it looks to me like it's possible that the channel has swung farther in towards the jetty. At the, in this 2003 image um, than it was in the 2001 image. 
And that's potentially what has caused some additional erosion at that location. Um, and you see saw a little bit of recovery of the central area that was eroded in 2001. Now this image in 2006 is a pretty good one. The small channel looks almost filled here, okay? And there's been growth almost along the entire stretch here. However, the deep trough is very well pronounced. So it's hard to say, you know, is this deep trough just forming now um, in terms of this image and we've had some growth prior to that? It's hard to say, but again, it's a persistent feature, but the small tidal channel that exists clearly has been plugged up by the sand. Okay, so I think that small channel is very important in the morphology of this location. Jumping to 2007, so we go from 2006 to 2007, mm -hmm. there's been erosion along the entire stretch basically, except for uh, beach growth adjacent, directly adjacent to the jetty. No dune growth, but beach growth. So there's been a recession of the entire dune. Again, if you pay attention to these green and yellow arrows, they're shifting along here, they're going back and forth. There's no unidirectional trend. I think that's one of the most important things that's coming out of all this. We're not seeing massive erosion in one direction all the time, like we do down in Camp Ellis, for instance, where they're losing sand two to three feet a year. This is shifting, and it's shifting in location along this little stretch. Jumping to 2008, you really can't tell much from here. Um, there's not much shoreline change. It's a stable period. Um, you can't tell much in terms of the ebb shoal or the small channel or deeper trough. It's, it's, it's a higher tide image. Uh, again, 2009 is also a higher tide image, but you can kind of see the ebb shoal and the deep trough. Again, over that year period, there is not much change in terms of the shoreline. It's a state, relatively stable period. 2011, you see dune loss adjacent to the trough, and you see some growth of the dune adjacent to closer to the jetty. Okay, so again, probably there was some wave attack from an event where that yellow arrow is pointing. You see some erosion of the dune and you see some growth of the dune where the green arrows are. And moving up to 2012, we're getting towards where we are today. Um, you can see a little bit of erosion adjacent to where the small channel might be, uh, but not really too much going on in terms of 2012. 2013 image, there is some dune loss adjacent to the trough, and as you can really see how well-defined that deep trough is right now in that image, I mean, you can really, really, really see it. Um, and if you look at the south end of the red box, which is, again, the left side of the red box, it looks kind of like the water level just drops right there. That's because these are two images that are stitched together, and the image on the left-hand side was taken at a different time. That's all, a different tide. But you can see how that deep trough um, goes right up to the beach. So I really think one of the things that's influencing the shoreline here, again, is that small channel. The second thing is the presence of this deeper trough, and it's allowing waves to come down that ebb shoal and attack that directly that section of beach. And the trough seems to shift a little bit back and forth, okay? But it's there, it's persistent. I showed you, since 1962 it's been there. So zooming, um, if, if you, this is a, just a topographic image showing the wave trains coming in. You can kind of see the waves coming in. I, I don't have a pointer, so where it says deeper trough, there's waves moving in just right towards the shoreline right there. So they're going to attack that stretch of Pine Point Beach. The ebb shoal, waves move along that and break on that, okay? So you're not having a lot of wave impact along that stretch. The dynamics adjacent to the inlet are driven by that small channel. So what are the longer term take home points here? Since the mid 1850s, we've seen nothing but really accretion in Pine Point and in some of the highest rates of anywhere in the state of Maine. Popham Beach has grown a little bit more, but it's also lost a lot more than Pine Point has. Now, the changes that we're seeing and the erosion that we're seeing is an episodic event. It's not unidirectional. It occurs, it goes away, it occurs, it goes away. And it relates to those three things. Tidal shoal dynamics, the presence of that nearshore trough that directs waves and allows waves and refraction of the waves along the sandbar so that they can actually attack that section of Pine Point. Now I'd like to go to the information that's in your agenda handouts um, that show recent trends that we've measured with uh, something called a real-time kinematic GPS unit. So the summary slide on, on all that is this figure one. Again, there's three pockets uh, over the last basically eight years where we've seen erosion of the dune system, okay? And that's probably driven by scour along the beach due to that deeper trough. 
But as you get closer to the right-hand side of the image, there's growth of the dunes and then a slight loss of the dunes that probably is related to that channel and the migration of that channel. You can actually see in the lower image where it says swash bar welding onto beach. Just below that, you can see that channel morphology, that bend. Okay. This next slide, figure two, is showing measured shoreline change, or, so shoreline change rates compiled from different vegetation line positions from 2006 to 2014. So we go out here every year, we walk the beach with a really precise GPS. It's accurate to about the size of a quarter, both vertically and horizontally. And we walk along the edge of the vegetation, okay? And then we compare those with previous years, and we come up with these linear regression shoreline changes. So these orange, red, and green transects that you see basically have a value associated with them that are uh, described in the shoreline change uh, in the legend in the upper left-hand corner in terms of feet per year. So anything yellow to red means it's eroding. Anything green to dark green means it's accreting. So starting all the way adjacent to, to, to the jetty, or very close to the jetty, you see that there's growth of the dunes of about you know, three to five feet, basically, per year from 2006 to 2014. So pretty significant growth. There's a little pocket of erosion, which is pointed to by the, the right black line coming from note erosion of dunes, um, a little pocket of erosion that it goes back to accretion. So that stretch right there uh, is basically accreting at about one foot per year if you average everything out, with the highest rate being adjacent to the jetty. As soon as you get away from that, you're looking at an entirely negative signal through there. So we've seen dune erosion from about the middle of the image toward to all the way to the left of about almost two feet per year okay, over this time period of 2006 to 2014. So clearly right now, one side is in a slight growth. There's a pocket of erosion in that area of growth, but then there is a significant erosive signal from the other stretch of the beach going towards the south. Can I ask you a question on that? Sure. Um, cool. So on that um, the black arrow that goes to the right that shows the erosion before going into the accretion, there's yes, that little pocket. Um, my eyesight is okay, which is really not. There's two bars of yellow, two bars of orange, and then two bars of yellow? Yep. Um, so rather than the distance of, um, of the erosion, what's the distance that goes across that length of land right there? Um, what would that equate to approximately? It's about 1,300 feet from the parking lot to the, the, uh, the, the jetty. Yeah, but I'm looking for just a track that's eroding in between the two accretions. I would guess, looking at the scale that's 0 to 120 feet, that's probably about 180, 200 feet, okay. I guess. Okay. I hope that helps. Thank you. The one little pocket. But yeah. if you look at the rest, it's, you know, you're looking at about, what, it gives 700 feet? scale. I couldn't yeah. see the, sorry, the print. <laughs> no worries. So one thing we also do is we, we, we mark the edge of the high water line to look at that. We're not only interested in what the vegetation is doing, but we're looking at that kind of this, the lower portion of that signal, the lower portion of that dry beach width to see what's happening. Because in this area, again, we know the dry beach width gets very, very narrow. So what we're seeing in terms of the high water line positions over that same time period, some of there's uh, a, a, two distinct signals. There's accretion of the high water line um, as you get closer to the park, so as you're going to the right or to the left of the image, I'm sorry, <coughs> there's an area of distinct erosion that clearly is related to that deep water trough that exists just offshore. And then you have accretion of the high water line as you get closer to the jetty. Okay, So about two, year, two feet per year minus four feet per year in that middle <coughs> area, and that's that area where you don't have a dry beach. At high tide, the, the water comes right up to the dune, basically. Okay. But that's something that we've also observed in some of those past episodic events that we've shown in the past. Okay. So that dry beach, that narrow dry beach width is not anything new. Um, but the erosion of the dune in that area is a current signal that I'm showing in the previous image right there. So kind of to summarize what we think is going on here, this is a 2013 aerial image. You've got dune growth adjacent to the jetty. You have that shallow channel that allows tides to scour the beach on both the incoming and the outgoing tide. Okay? If you ever kayak in this area 
and try to paddle against that current, whether it's coming in or out, you're not going to get very far. You can do it. But it's, it, it's like one, sitting in one of those wave things or, the, you know, a stream that's just going right at you. And you're, it's so hard to get past, De depending on which way. If the tide's coming in and you're paddling out, you're all not going to get anywhere. If the tide's going out and you're coming in, you're surely not going to get anywhere. So that channel and the way it flips back and forth is episodic, but that's clearly the cause of the erosion in that area. The scour along the beach is clearly related to that deep water channel um, that allows waves to attack that section of the beach, and that's clearly shown by that high water line position that I showed you. So this is kind of another summary slide just showing you uh, the, the vegetation changes uh, of the dune over the last eight years um, in relation to those features I just showed. So I already showed you this slide. I just wanted to update it by going into our short-term changes they appear to reflect those past episodic shoreline changes that we've seen. I really don't think what we're seeing is, is anything dramatically new. This section of Pine Point Beach undergoes periods of erosion, and it goes, undergoes periods of accretion. And unfortunately, they're related to these larger dynamics of this ebb tidal shoal, this deep water channel, and not something, if not whether or not we're raking the beach, not whether or not we're putting up the correct sand fences on the beach and things like that. It's these larger dynamics that are harder to, to control that are causing this episodic erosion. But again, what I think is important is it's not unidirectional. It's not just going whoosh and screaming inland. So my final take-home points, and I hope I've entertained you relatively well for, <laughs> for this <laughs> workshop. Um, again, the erosion here is episodic that shifts in location. Okay. Sometimes when that channel whips against the shoreline, it's adjacent to the channel. When that deep water trough coincides with wave attack, it's associated with that. Now, it's clear that the dune and beach has gone through periods of recovery also. Okay. It's not a unidirectional phenomenon. And again, the shift in the sandbars, the presence of those near shore channels, and the wave interactions are driving the changes along the beach. Um, and that's all I had uh, in terms of the geology of this area. So uh, we've done a lot of work on Western Beach. And we haven't done that much work on Pine Point Beach itself in terms of studies. This is just a short-term study that we pulled together. I'm happy to look at this more, and I think it's very, very important post-dredge to look at that little channel that I showed you that whips around. Let's go back to an image just so we can look. look. That little channel where, next to where it says shallow channel. One of my hypotheses is when this, when this gets dredged, when the river gets dredged, that creates a much larger area, volume, for the water to rush in and out of the Scarborough River. Therefore, the little small shallow channel is going to, I'm sorry, I'm doing it again. Uh, the little small channel is going to become less important in terms of having currents go in and out. Okay, so that's a hypothesis, we think. Um, the problem with that hypothesis is that thing's been there since the 60s, that little channel on the edge. Sure, it's whipped in and out, but so anyway, that's a hypothesis that we have. Um, so I think that'll be very interesting to continue to do some studies on that. So we're, we're, we're planning on doing some shoreline uh, transects in that area, kind of keep track of that and see if that hypothesis has any merit. Um, and then it certainly makes sense to continue to do surveys in this area. Um, to, to, to see if the erosive trend that we're seeing continues or if it goes back to accreting. Because there were profile studies that were done in this location in the past that would have triggered a DEP permit to do some beach scraping. <coughs> and the limits of erosion that were supposed to be met were never met. And the signal turned around and became a it, it grew again. Uh, now it's just entering another phase. So um, anyway, that's what I had for you folks tonight, and I'm happy to sit down and discuss this and f further answer any questions you have and go from there. Perhaps next well, time Pete could be more thorough and better prepared. Yeah. Uh, uh, conversation. I, I guess, well, let me just start off. I'd like to say um, certainly thank you for, for coming down and, um, and again, just to reiterate what Tom said. So, you know, the, the pictures and the graphs are outstanding. It helps, I know, certainly myself to kind of understand what the history is in the area. How, like you said, how it grows and shrinks and grows and shrinks and kind of has a natural rhythm to it a little bit. Um, I do want to just, uh, maybe we'll offer to the counselors first. Um, if there's any questions for... 
Um, not a question, but um, so thank you. I learned more, I think, um, about um, a pine point erosion and let alone um, the ecology part of this uh, town um, in the last 25, 30 minutes. I would love to see the same charts and the same analysis just to the left of the parking lot if the town is moving forward regarding the discussion around um, a development issue that was brought up before. Do you know, I, I think do you know anything about the beach from Hurt Park to Royal we, Orchard? We actually have all of the same data that I'm yep. showing here for that area. I just left it out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I, I mean, but in a nutshell, what, what it deals with another issue the town's going to be dealing with. I, I don't remember offhand um, what the trend is over there. There's a, where that trough ends, when you walk the beach there, you're literally walking on a, a wider dry beach, and then suddenly it literally just, whoop, if you're walking towards the mm -hmm. jetty. It just whips in where that trough is. Mm -hmm. You get to that area where there's no dry beach. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it, it's, I mean, the folks that live down there see it all the time. And you, if you're walking from Heard Park south, you just, and you can see it actually in the image um, where the orange, I wish I had a pointer, where the orange, Im the orange colors kind of come in from left to right. Um, and that's where that shoreline kind of whips in. Um, so yeah, but to answer your question, we do have data um, going all the way down through Old Orchard Beach and Saco Bay, so I'm happy to provide data for that area. Peter? Hey, just a quick question. And actually, I was a geology major, so the first time I've actually oh, cool. <laughs> any people to <laughs> <laughs> uh, Question though, it sounds like the small channel, is it related to the jetty? I mean, is that why the channel is there? Well, that's, is a good, that's a good question. And to get an answer to that, we have to do a little bit more digging, I think. Um, I suspect that there was there were, that there were several channels. There was a main channel and several little offshoot channels uh, associated with this ebb tidal delta that used to exist there uh, before it was stabilized in '62. Um, but we'd have to go back and look at some older images to confirm. But most of these older systems had a main channel and then several locations where that channel either migrated to and then migrated back and left like a little remnant that was a little bit deeper. Um, so I suspect it was I suspect it was there, uh, but now it's kind of pinned to the edge of the jetty. So the jetty it can't whip uh, inland. It has to kind of go around the jetty before it whips inland. So are there any adjustments that could be made to the jetty that would? That's a good question. I, you know I don't know. Um, I think the first the first thing we need to do is go back and look and see if it was there. Yeah. And I suspect we will find that it was, probably in a different location with a slightly different orientation and things. Um, but one of the things I've been playing around with in my mind is, and again, this goes back to some hypotheses, I think it's important to track to see how that channel responds to the dredge, number one. Because if it responds by closing or becoming much less pronounced, that means that when you deepen the, the, the main channel, the currents are going to flow more in and out of that, and that's going to become less important. And I think if that happens, some of the erosive trends that we see, or I, I, I won't call them erosive trends, I'll call them unpredictable shoreline change trends, because they're clearly not all erosive. That could become a positive signal right. more often. Right. Yeah. So potentially doing something with that shallow channel might result in a positive trend. Um, the question then becomes, you've got that deep trough there. What's that caused by? Is that just the bottom topography? That's I think so, yeah. It's that probably, um, at some point, probably, the entire channel shifted through that area. If you just go and look at the bathymetry around Little River also, there is a trough, a deeper trough where the channel used to be, where it came out. And I suspect if we went back far enough, probably 1800s, 1700s, before stuff was done here, you'd probably see a, sec a, small, a smaller pine point um, with a uh, section of the channel that whipped through where the jetty is now and came out near that trough, <laughs> is my guess. Um, did, did, did I hear you say that you know, coming off a fresh dredge just last month, frankly, mm. is your office prepared to yeah. do some you know, yep. follow-up on your hypotheses? Yep, we are. That's terrific. Is there anything that can we be done to alter the deep channel? I think you'd have to, if you're getting into that question, it, you probably need to be looking into some hydrodynamic modeling um, to look and see, because the, the core is authorized to dredge that channel to a congressionally 
given depth. I think it's eight feet yeah. in lower low water or something like that. That's just off the top of my head, so don't quote me on that one. So dredging past that, usually by a foot or two is okay. Um, just they'll say it's like pre-dredging, so it'll decrease the amount of shoaling that's going to occur and all that. But going significantly past that actually would require an act of Congress to change the authorized depth of the channel. <laughs> Again, the hypothesis for that shallow channel, I think, needs to be proven before you suggest anything in terms of deepening the, the main channel. Um, I think Pine Point's problems of shoaling are going to continue. I mean, you're going to need to be dredged in five to ten years again. It, it's, this is a sand sink. The sand just comes up the bay and goes into the jetty. Was put in to try to keep the sand from going in. All right, the jetties always cause problems. So and sure every place has been jetty. Yeah, been and and you know down in Camp Ellis, the jetties cause erosion. Here, you know, it's trapping some sand adjacent to the jetty. Whether or not the jetty here is causing erosion is is, in fact, it, is part of the Camp Ellis solution removal or modification of the jetty. No, no, no. That was looked in. Thirty-one different alternatives were looked at. That was one of them, <laughs> and. Removing the jetty removes Camp Ellis. You remove that, that is pinning the community in place. Mm -hmm. There's not enough sand to support that maintaining so itself without the jetty. Camp Ellis needs our sand if we don't want it, so they can come. Well, they can come <laughs> I mean, this, this certainly brings up a larger discussion that we're having with the Army Corps of Engineers, and I think as part of SLOG, also the Sea Level Adaptation Working Group, um, is the concept of regional sediment management. So all the sand comes from Camp Ellis and the Saco River. All the sand ends up here, clogging the channel, but not making it to Western Beach where it would go naturally. Right. So over the last two dredges, it's been placed at Western Beach. Part of the concept is to recycle the sand, but it takes agreements between the communities. Mm. It takes the Army Corps of Engineers wanting to do it and then seeing that the cost of benefit is there. Mm. And if the cost of benefit's not there, guess who's going to pay for it? The communities. Um, but if the option is at sea disposal, Presumably they could barge it down to the other end of Saco Bay and deposit it there. And they did in 1996 as a test, but they dumped it in one of the worst spots, <laughs> and then the sand just sat and didn't move. And finally, when it did move, it basically went and plugged up Goose Wow. Um, is there any other quick questions? Yeah, I just wanted to make sure we're cognizant of time. So, um, do you have a result set on the council? Mm -hmm. All right, is there any questions from the audience? Feel free to come up if you do. I have a question. Uh, and if we could, your, your name and address. Sure. Um, my name is Ben Leone, and I actually live in Portland. Uh, I'm here because I'm an attorney, and I'm representing some of the property owners down here on Pine Point. Um, I just have a question about the dune grass and um, how the dune grass contributes to the stability of the dune system, and then. Um, you may answer the second part of this question with the first part, but uh, if there was no dune grass in this area, um, say it all burned, uh, how would that affect the stability of the area? Um, how would that affect uh, the dune's ability to withstand some of the wave action that you talked about? Thanks. I'll answer the first part of your question first. Um, Dune grass plays an important role in helping store sand within the system. Um, and one of the things that we've always done anthropogenically is try to maintain the dunes by planting, by putting up fencing um, to trap sand. So the way dunes basically work, they work in several different ways, but the role of dune grass is actually to help maintain the dunes. Dune grass, as it grows, um, it's basically one large plant. It's one specimen. So it's not individual plants. You, you plant individual plants, but they all become intertwined and become one, basically. The way they work is wind blows sand along the beach. The sand hits the plants and starts to settle out. During storms, waves hit the beach and they deposit sand on the upper portions of the profile. It covers the dune grass. And over time, the dune grass grows through the, the sand. As long as you don't cover it with about this much sand, it'll grow through. And therefore, it kind of perpetuates and it continues to uh, grow in a seaward direction as long as there's a sediment supply to support it. There has to be enough sand moving into the system, and at Pine Point, generally, there is, um, except for this episodic whipping of the channel. 
and the attacks by waves. Um, so that's the first part. The second part, if all the dune grass is gone from that location, you said burning it? I just, I, I heard that back okay. in the 60s and 70s, some towns did that. Interesting. Um, I don't recommend doing that, but um, <laughs> if it was gone, I, you know, I suspect that what would happen, there's so much sand in this system at this location, um, and, as you, and as you go slightly farther down the bay, that I suspect you probably have a, a larger dry beach because, of course, the dune grass would be gone. Um, and, of course, a lot of Pine Point is actually artificially created anyway, so the elevations in there are higher than what a natural dune would attain anyway. Um, so, uh, so I guess if there was no dune grass, you probably still have a pretty good sized beach, but I think the elevations of what currently is the dune probably would go down slightly because of aeolian transport due to the wind and there not being any grass there to trap it. So uh, that's a tough question to answer. I really can't give you a good answer as to what would happen if all the dune grass burned away. Um, Typically, as dune grass goes away, you know you lose the functionality of the dune system, which is the buffer for everything inland. Uh, but again, this this is the artificial system because of the fill that was placed um, to to build up Pine Point. So uh, the other thing that I wanted to add to that is very quickly. Very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> um, the way we've also managed dunes in the past is by placement of fencing um, and the fencing is meant to artificially replicate what a dune, what dune grass does on its own, which is to cause sand to settle out and therefore build up the dunes higher. Um, and fencing typically shouldn't be placed right at the edge of grass. It should be placed about six feet seaward of grass so that the dune grass that's there can grow onto the beach. And then you end up with a dune that's prograding or building seaward and builds higher because sand is getting trapped in. And I'm, I'm sorry for taking this question. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, well, I did want to just, again, thank you very much for, for giving me time. Uh, I, I have a question. I can give you one more question, and then we have to wrap up for the council meeting. Okay. So I can you give you one more. Yeah. Okay. My name is Claude Shear, and I live on Pillsbury Drive. And um, what's the connection between um, the movement of the sand and the change in the floodplain? Um, generally, as the sand builds up, I would suspect that the elevations of the dune would grow higher, uh, and therefore, as a dune grows higher, it becomes more of a buffer for storm events. Uh, and because of that, um, depending on how high it is, typically a dune needs to be at least one foot higher than the base flood elevation, mm -hmm. which is the B zone. Uh, for it to have any significant impact on waves. Um, three feet higher is the best best thing, but it's pretty hard to get a dune system that's three feet higher than the V-zone based flood elevation. Um, and to that point, in fact, uh, they're still preliminary, but some of FEMA's recent work with floodplains actually show the, the, most, the area most prone for flooding is the backside, is the river side, not the ocean. Mm -hmm. Side, yeah, right. largely due to the and existence of the dune. But the, the, the new FEMA map, doesn't that have the floodplain moving south and inland on the ocean side of Pine Point? I, I don't recall. I, I, know it has I, a breach, it I know it has a breach zone at Heard Heard Park, Park. Yeah, and I know it, if I remember correctly, the first three properties are in a, maybe it's an a, a coastal A zone or a high A zone, um, but also the width of the dune system plays a large role right. in, in buffering the storms. Um, so if I could, I beg your pardon to cut short, but the council okay. meeting starts at 7. Just to, just to wrap things up, uh, the good news is we have a great resource in town, um, and his office is interested and willing to continue to look at the situation. Um, for our part, the town did create a beach monitoring position. Part of that responsibility is monitoring wildlife species, plovers <laughs> in particular, but uh, that job description is broader than that. In fact, Brian Wynn is here 
uh, and continues to work with us on issues like this. And we're also commissioning some work through the Maine Cooperative Extension to do beach profiling, oh, good. Uh, which will be another bit of data that will help inform what's happening out there. Uh, so that's kind of an update of things in motion that we'll continue um, looking at going forward. Well, thank you again thank you. for You're taking the time welcome. to come down and talk to us. And that was great. Thank you very much.